Alright, this is our next video from the Gilded Age, uh, talking now about the growth of labor unions. We've already talked about uh, the growth of big business, and so hopefully we'll start to see uh, some of these connections, how these different topics are going to interconnect with one another, uh, especially this one. This one and business go uh, hand in hand. Okay, so uh, what changed in the Gilded Age that caused this growth of the labor union movement. Uh, well, we've got to look at what was going on before uh, in the pre-Civil War era. Uh, there, there were no real nationwide unions. Uh, there were some attempts, uh, but they weren't very successful. Um, there were small unions, localized or regional unions. Most of those were wiped out uh, due to the uh, economic problems of the, the Panic of 1837. Um, trade unions, also called craft unions, uh, these are going to be uh, local groups of, of people who are all engaged in the same activity. So uh, your your local uh, shoemakers, uh, those kinds of unions did tend to be successful. So there were unions before the Gilded Age, uh, but we don't think of them. Okay, during the Civil War, uh, labor shortages in the north uh, caused wages to go up. Okay? You have a lot of people that are off uh, serving in the army. Uh, businesses need employees to make things uh, for the military, especially during the Civil War. And so labor was at a premium. They had to attract workers and they had to keep workers. After the Civil War, what's different uh, is it goes back to some of the things we saw in the business video. Okay? Social Darwinism. Okay. That idea of social Darwinism, which became popular uh, during the Gilded Age, one side of the coin is business owners succeed because something in their, their DNA, you might say, allows them to be successful. The flip side of that is what leads to people being poor? What leads to people being on the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder? Well, it must be something in their DNA. So these common, ordinary laborers just weren't seen as good as other people. Okay? Uh, the owners, their attitudes also changed. Their attitudes uh, not only toward labor, but also to the way business operated. Okay? Uh, one of the ways owners' attitudes changed is uh, the economic ex expectations of the Gilded Age focused on maximizing profits. Not just making profits, but just maximizing them, getting as much profit as you could. Uh, it's not only about being successful, it's about how successful can you be. One of the ways that businesses can maximize their profits is to lower costs. And the biggest cost for any business is always going to be its labor. That is true of any business, that is true of any organization. But the workers are the biggest cost. And so one of the goals was to lower that specific cost. Some companies are going to uh, pay their workers in, in company money. Uh, sometimes it's called script or uh, CHIT, C-H-I-T. And they, you, the workers would then turn around they would use that money. That money's not good anywhere except at some place called the company store. Or uh, you might rent your house from the company. and So you pay your rent back to the company with that. Uh, the company would do this because then they don't have to pay you actual money. They can pay you fake money and you just give it back to them and so so they feel like they're they're saving on their labor costs whereas you know you're out here going I want to buy other things that aren't available at the store and I can't workers as this stuff chart starts to change workers are going to fight back of course they're going to fight back and when they fought back the owners resisted and they would fire people who uh, complained they would fire people who were uh, labor agitators they would do what they could to discourage the formation of unions, uh, whatever that took, uh, in many cases, uh, the employers are going to pit the workers against each other. That's a successful strategy in any time you're trying to beat a group, uh, divide and conquer. If you can get them fighting amongst each other, then your job of beating the whole group is a lot easier. So they'd pit unskilled and skilled worker get workers against each other. We'll see what these are in just a second. And they would even uh, pit 
people together based on their race, uh, hiring immigrants uh, and African Americans to play on uh, people's prejudices. Uh, in some of the businesses, they would hire they would specifically hire immigrants from many different ethnic backgrounds because then the immigrants didn't have a common language. And so, yeah, you might be able to talk with your your five percent of the workforce over here that speaks your same language, but you can't talk with the other ninety five percent. Um, so they, they do things like that to keep people from organizing. Okay, so what kinds of workers are we talking about? When we start talking about laborers, what are we talking about? There's really only two kinds of workers in the world. Skilled workers, the first one, skilled workers are people who are highly trained. Uh, the business uh, has invested a lot of time and a lot of money into developing them and their skills, and so it's very difficult to replace them. You cannot just grab someone off the street, throw them into this job, and, and they'll be perfect at it. Uh, they're going to mess up, and you're going to have to train them over uh, many, maybe even years. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of money. You're going to invest in them. Because they're so difficult to replace, they earn higher wages. Skilled workers can more successfully negotiate for higher wages because they know that the business can't as easily replace them. And that's true all the way through the 1800s. This that's true today. However, during the Gilded Age, skilled workers are facing challenges from mechanization, from the new machinery that is being created, from the new inventions, the new technology, starting to put skilled workers out of work. Okay? One, one example, and I'll, I use this example uh, for something later on, cigar rollers. Someone who rolls a cigar by hand is a skilled worker. If you uh, roll the cigar too tight, uh, you're unable to draw enough air through it. When you're trying to light it, it won't light. If you roll it too loose, it will burn too quickly or it, or it will otherwise fall apart. So, so there's, a, there's a skill, there's an art form almost to rolling a cigar. Well, during the Gilded Age, someone invents a, a little machine, no bigger than a laptop computer, uh, and you stretched out on the machine a tobacco leaf. You then uh, measured the amount of tobacco you put in it, and then you turned a little hand crank, and it rolled the cigar perfectly every single time time and you no longer had to worry about a skilled worker doing that. You just needed somebody who could use the measuring cup, dump that in there, and turn a crank. Those people are called unskilled workers. Okay? There's a picture of an unskilled worker. Uh, you can see what else uh, we might define as an unskilled worker during the Gilded Age. Uh, look, she can't be older than about 12 years old, maybe even younger. Uh, the children are going to class be counted as unskilled workers. Now, unskilled workers require very little training. They they turn a crank, they push a button, they pull a lever. Um, that makes them much much easier to replace because if I need to fire them or if they go on strike, I can pretty much grab anybody off the street and have them do this job. Therefore, unskilled workers end up earning lower wages because they are so easy to replace and, and they can't demand higher wages. If they demand higher wages, uh, they end up being fired. So this is another thing that's going on during the Gilded Age. We have skilled workers being replaced by unskilled workers. And that's going to cause friction between the two groups. Alright, so as businesses uh, started taking advantage of workers, labor unions are going to start form, going to start to form. So here we have the basics. Um, the basic goals of all labor unions, higher wages, safer and better working conditions, and fewer hours. These, these are the main basics. And notice I've stayed away from specifics. What kind of wages, what kind of working conditions, uh, what kind of hours, because it would vary from business to business, place to place. Uh, you know, think about, think about hours. Uh, if you start out working a 14 hour day, you'd probably be happy with a 12 hour day. Now, if you're work already working a 12-hour day, you'll probably be happy with a 10-hour day. Now, as long as you're getting your, your hours cut. Um, 
in society, when these unions are forming during the Gilded Age, uh, different groups of people have different views on these unions. Okay? The upper class, obviously, is going to tend to be against the unions because the upper class were pretty much the owners of the big businesses, and so they're, they're fighting against these labor unions. So, of course, most of those are going to be against labor unions. The working class and the poor, obviously, support unions because that, that is among their socioeconomic class. Okay? If your union is successful, maybe you can come over to my business and, and make me and my fellow workers successful over here. The middle class is where you're going to get different reactions because some people in the middle class are uh, professionals and they're educated and they're going to be managers working for the factory. So when you go on strike, you're not only striking against the, the owner up there, you're also striking against your managers. And so those people in the middle class would, would tend, they might feel for the workers, they might understand their, they might understand their positions, um, but they are going to work against them. On the other hand, skilled workers can also be middle class. Uh, some of the managers in the factories that would be middle class, uh, they will be working side by side with the workers. And so, uh, depending on where you are in that, that management chain of command, depending on where your background was, uh, you might also support the unions. Okay, It all had to do with, with what your experiences were, uh, what your social network was, and uh, what kind of job you had. Now, in order to get their demands met, in order to get what they want, labor unions have a couple of tools they can use, and so we'll look at these real quick. Um, labor unions like to use something called collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is where uh, the union negotiates one contract that will then be applied to all the workers. Uh, what some businesses would do is they would negotiate individual contracts with individual workers so you didn't exactly know who was making what uh, when your fellow employee come to you, comes to you and says, you know, hey, I, I want us to fight for, you know, a, a dollar an hour. Well, I'm already making a dollar fifty. I don't want to work. I don't want to work for a dollar an hour. It'll make me lose fifty cents. Uh, but he didn't know that. Now, he didn't know that you were already making more than him. Um, so collective bargaining allows every worker to have the same contract. Uh, unions would also use things called work slowdowns. That is where they deliberately uh, are less productive. And they, they do this for, for one, or, one of two reasons. Uh, one is uh, they're, they're trying to disrupt the business activity. They, they're, they're trying to slow the work down because they're, they're trying to cause the business to lose money. Another reason for a work slowdown is uh, to encourage the business to hire more people who are then going to turn around and join the union. Okay, so there's two reasons for a work slowdown there. Okay. Uh, they would occasionally sabotage equipment. Uh, if, if skilled workers, if they see machines being brought in, uh, the skilled workers will try to, to damage that equipment. So, oh, well, you know, that equipment breaks down. We don't. Uh, you should definitely keep skilled workers around. And then, of course, uh, probably the most easy to recognize tool of unions is the strike. Okay? Refusing to go to work until the demands of the union are met, whatever that is, higher wages, fewer hours. Um, during the Gilded Age, these strikes are going to in, usually result in violence. And so when the union decided to go on strike, uh, it, was, it wasn't something that they just did on a whim. They thought about it, they planned, they, they wanted to, they preferred negotiation. Because they knew when they voted to go on strike, there would be violence, and it was entirely possible they would not all be together again. Somebody, somebody would might die. Now, unions have tools to fight business. Business has tools they use to fight labor, and business has more tools to fight labor. Businesses would occasionally get workers to sign things called yellow dog contracts. You might see this with a different term, uh, but what they are, they're, they're clauses inside the contracts that specifically state uh, you as the employee were not allowed to join or form a union. That was grounds for termination. 
they found you doing these things, uh, they could fire you on the spot. Uh, if the business felt uh, that you were trying to form a union uh, and, and they were kind of worried that, that it had already get, maybe gotten a foothold, businesses would do something called a lockout. A lockout is where they lock the door and they refuse to let the employees come to work. Now, on the one hand, you think, well, well, that, that seems kind of dumb. Why would they do that? Think of it like this. Uh, as the union is forming, these workers aren't going to have saved up money for a strike. So so they're, they're still living paycheck to paycheck, and all of a sudden the business, they show up to work and the door is locked. Hey, boss, let us in. The boss says, I'm not going to let you in. But, it, but if I can't go to work, then I can't get paid, then my family starves. Why aren't you going to let us in? Well, because I've heard some union talk, and the only way I'm going to let you in is if you give up the leaders of this movement to unionize uh, the factory or whatever. And, um, once they found out who was trying to form unions or who was causing problems, they would put you on a blacklist. Uh, this is a list of people that the businesses would, would circulate around the area amongst themselves. Okay, uh, here, here, is a, here is John Smith. He is on the blacklist. Don't hire him because he causes problems in your factory, in your business. And so they would try to keep these people from, from getting jobs, because uh, if you can, you know, if you've got the labor organizer and he's unemployed, you keep him, you silence him, and you, you keep avoid all that trouble. Um, if you ever end up researching the history of the labor movement during the Gilded Age, sometimes the research can be kind of hard because if your name did get on a blacklist, well, how are you going to go get another job? Simple way is to change your name. And you're talking, you know, the late 1800s, you know, you could walk around with an assumed name and nobody would know. More tools of business. Uh, businesses could employ people called strike breakers. Um, that, is, that is exactly what it sounds like. People that are going to go in and break up the strike. One of the companies that offered uh, this as their service was Pinkerton's uh, security. They they offered to go in and break up physically, break up strikes and force the employees to go back to work. Uh, businesses can also hire scabs. That's actually a derogatory term. And uh, sometimes you see uh, these two terms inter interchange. Okay, sometimes people will, will refer to strike breakers. Uh, they'll refer to scabs as strike breakers. Uh, but what those what those are what those scabs are uh, are replacement workers. Okay, uh, the 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 original workers have gone on strike, but while they are on strike, I am going to hire people to come in. Um, you might have heard of people crossing the picket line. You had to walk through those striking employees on your way to work in the business. Um, you are highly looked down upon by the union. Um, the threat of violence against a scab. Uh, or someone who crosses the picket line is, is goes way up because these these strikers see you as aiding the enemy. As long as that factory remains open, the business makes money, and and we can't get what we want. You are enabling the business to stay open. Um, often, both strike breakers and scabs would be immigrants or African Americans. Okay, For a lot of immigrants coming to the United States during this time period, uh, working as a strike breaker or a replacement worker was, was the first job they could get. Same for African Americans who are moving to the North. Let's not forget this is going on mostly in the North. Um, those are the first jobs they can get. As a result, some of the original unions are going to be anti-immigrant and are also going to be uh, discriminatory against African Americans. Businesses can also get the government involved. Now here's another connection uh, to what we've already seen. We, we saw that government took a laissez-faire attitude toward business. Uh, let it be. Leave it alone. If government is going to take a laissez-faire attitude toward the economy, when a strike happens, the government's going to look at a business and say, well, you, you have a problem. You, as the business, need to go solve that. But instead, government 
doesn't really take a laissez-faire approach. They take a pro-business approach. And so the businesses will often get local police or the U.S. Army uh, to help break up strikes. Uh, they would also go to court and get court orders ordering the strikes to end. It's, it's kind of one of the first things you did. And then uh, when the, the union refused uh, to follow the court order, then you could get the police to go in because they're, they're violating the court order. Um, the way businesses would do this, one of the ways they did this, is through a, a creative interpretation. That is my term. A creative interpretation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act banned all combinations in restraint of trade. And we'll see in a little bit, the businesses will argue that that's exactly what unions are. Workers combining in strikes to stop trade. Uh, it's a lot more tools of, of business against unions. Okay, we're going to go through, uh, hopefully kind of quickly, some of the big unions from the Gilded Age you need to know. Uh, there are other unions out there, but these are just some of the ones uh, we, we kind of want to mention. The first one is the National Labor Union. Uh, it was formed in 1866, and it was, a, it was an all-inclusive union. It included both skilled and unskilled workers. It also included farmers. And this is going to kind of be the one time you see farmers included here. Uh, their membership peaked at around 600,000. Uh, it's nationwide membership, by the way. And they were at least successful in getting Congress to pass an eight-hour day for federal employees. If you're jaded about the government, uh, well, here's the bureaucracy getting the eight-hour day, but the rest of America having to suffer through 10 and 12-hour days. Um, but it sets an important precedent. Now, unfortunately for the National Labor Union, they collapsed around 1872. Uh, it's, it's not a long record. It's only about six years. Uh, the reason they collapsed is the division between the members. I mean, their, their membership. You have, you have the skilled workers uh, versus the unskilled workers. Uh, and then farmers. Farmers also have you know completely different goals from skilled and unskilled workers. Um, and so the divisions were just too too difficult to overcome, uh, particularly when, when the leadership was just kind of weak and not effective and the organization was kind of chaotic. Uh, and then uh, in the 1870s, uh, there will be a series of uh, economic problems, economic depressions, uh, that will kind of just finish them off. Yeah. Now, another... Uh, nationwide labor union that exists is called the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor formed in 1869 and again uh, includes both skilled and unskilled workers, but you'll notice here they've dropped the farmers. Um, probably their most famous uh, leader is this guy named Terence Powderly. Uh, he, was, he was elected in 1878 to lead the Knights of Labor uh, and so he will be kind of the driving force in that uh, union for several years. The main goals of the Knights of Labor, they have, they have a lot of them. First is the eight-hour workday. Okay. Um, they believe that, that an, there, there was, and there's evidence to prove that uh, eight hours is a good di division of our time. Uh, one of their slogans would be eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Okay. Um, they also wanted the government to uh, pass health and safety laws, stuff to regulate business. Uh, shocking, crazy uh, things there. They also wanted to see women and men paid equally, and they wanted to see African Americans paid equally as well. They also wanted the government to abolish child labor. Uh, this is not necessarily just a magnanimous, uh, let's keep kids from working. Uh, part of the reason, as a business, you would hire a child uh, to do any job is because that is, is kind of menial work and I don't want to have to pay a full-grown adult to do something like, like say, sweep up uh, when I can hire a kid for, for so much less and they're probably going to be uh, pretty much as productive. Um, so they felt this was a way actually to get uh, more adults hired. And then they also wanted, and, and here's, you know, where maybe we, we think that they would cross a line, uh, they want the government to own, not just regulate, 
uh, but take ownership of some of the big utilities, the telegraphs, the telephones, and the railroads. They see these as, as some of the more evil corporations, uh, and they believe that if the government owned them, they would treat the employees uh, fairly. Okay. Uh, so these are some very, very big goals, uh, and uh, oh, they also uh, wanted the government to allow people to use these things called greenbacks. Greenbacks were a different form of paper money that had been used during the Civil War. Uh, the government was trying to call in. The government was trying to get rid of greenbacks because uh, it was causing inflation, and uh, they wanted uh, to be able to use these greenbacks. They wanted them to continue to be printed uh, so that they could help pay off their debts. Membership in the Knights of Labor peaked around the early part of 1886. Uh, they had over one million members nationwide. Uh, so it's a huge, huge union, huge membership. Um, unfortunately, after that peak membership of um, over a million uh, in early 1886, uh, they are going to swiftly collapse. And it has to do with something called the Haymarket Riot. This is something that uh, tests uh, like to ask a lot about, so, so pay attention here to the Haymarket Riot. Um, what it is, it, there is a planned protest in downtown Chicago at a place called Haymarket Square. It's scheduled for May 4th, 1886. Uh, what they're protesting is uh, police brutality against striking workers the day before, May 3rd. Uh, the, the McCormick uh, company, their employees uh, manufacture farm implements, and they had gone on strike, and on May 3rd, uh, the police had come in and, and driven the strikers off uh, through great violence. And so uh, they just, the Knights of Labor decide let's hold a protest in downtown Chicago to protest the brutality against the strikers. At the end of the day, the, the, the protest lasts all day. And uh, it is a mostly peaceful demonstration. At the end of the day, and, and we're talking like 10 o'clock at night, uh, most of the protesters have gone home. Okay. Um, the vast majority of them have gone home, but there's still some there. And at the end of the day, uh, as the police move in to, to say, all right, you've had your say, it is time for everyone to get off the street and go home, uh, someone from the crowd throws a bomb. And they don't exactly know who threw the bomb. Um, it was not a small homemade thing either. I mean, it was it, seven police officers were killed, 60 were wounded. And so this was a horrendous act of violence. Um, and even though they weren't able to figure out who did it, uh, several members of the leadership of the Knights of Labor, since they organized the protest, they were arrested. And the Knights of Labor were linked to radicalism. They were linked to anarchy. Uh, part of the problem that the, the Knights had uh, here was that uh, they said they were they were sponsoring this protest and someone went out and made up flyers uh, saying the Socialist Party of America and the Knights of Labor are holding this protest. Um, someone from the Socialists, you know, said, yeah, we're, we're, we're in this with you. We're, we're co-hosting this or whatever. Um, and they really weren't, but because these flyers existed and because you had someone who was uh, targeting police, uh, the Knights were linked to radicalism, they were linked to anarchy, and once that happened, their, their outside support and the support from their own members uh, just rapidly collapsed. Uh, as you as a, either a labor supporter or you as a member of the Knights of Labor did not want people to think you were associated with the radicalism. There to uh, step in for the collapsing Knights of Labor is the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. Uh, officially, the AFL was formed in 1886, although there was a, another organization that they came from uh, that had uh, formed as early as 1881. But the president of the AFL is going to be this guy named Samuel Gompers. He's going to serve as president from the time the AFL officially forms in 1886 uh, till his death in 1924. Uh, there was a one-year period in there where he was not president. But Samuel Gompers and the AFL... Uh, focused on what Gompers called bread and butter unionism. Just the basics. Okay. Gompers believed that, that one of the problems the Knights of Labor had is, is they had 
they had gone too far. They had called for too much change. And so Gompers would say, look, there, there are some key things that, that we want, and these are the, key, these are the things we're going to focus on. One is the eight-hour day. Two is, depending on what industry, uh, depending on what the current conditions are, better wages, better benefits, and safer conditions. That's it. That's the basics. That's your bread and your butter as a union. Okay. He wanted the union to stay out of politics. He said this was, this was part of the problem of the Knights of Labor. They had gotten political. They wanted the government to own things. And uh, Gompers said that if the AFL stays out of that, that, that would make them seem less radical. And hopefully that would make them seem more, more palatable, more acceptable uh, to Americans. Okay. These, these unions, uh, don't be naive here, these unions didn't all work together either. Okay. Part of the reason the AFL formed is because uh, the Knights of Labor and another union organization got into uh, an argument uh, Gomper's original organization, uh, they had been uh, negotiating with uh, some, I believe it was a steel company, and uh, they're trying to negotiate higher wages, higher wages, and, and finally they, they're right there, the, the business is almost ready to sign the contract, and the Knights of Labor came in and said, if you will hire our workers, they will work for less than what those that other union over there is trying to get you to do, and, and the business ended up signing the contract with the Knights of Labor. Okay? Um, and so these, these unions are sometimes in competition. Now, the AFL is also an exclusive union. Okay? Uh, and by that I mean they, they only let certain people in. It is for skilled workers. Samuel Gompers started his career out as a cigar roller. That's why I used that example earlier. Because Samuel Gompers was trained in how to roll cigars and how to roll them correctly. And he is being replaced by unskilled workers uh, who are just turning a crank. Okay. Um, they also would exclude women uh, and African Americans and immigrants. Women, all three of these groups uh, were seen as groups uh, that would that were taking jobs away from these skilled workers that were working as strike breakers or scabs uh, or becoming the, like I said, becoming the unskilled workers. They, uh, all three groups would be paid less uh, due to prejudice and, and discrimination, whatever else. And, and that's part of the reason that, that's also part of the reason the AFL won't let them join because uh, you take lower pay. Uh, you're offered lower pay and you take it, uh, which keeps uh, a skilled man from getting uh, that kind of job. And by 1900, the AFL's membership uh, was at over 500,000. Okay? Uh, so this is nationwide. And we talk about the AFL a lot because uh, they have been uh, a long lasting union, they are still around. I've talked about some unions, so we'll finish up talking about uh, some important strikes. Now, not all of them. Just like our list of unions was not an exhaustive list of all unions, um, this is not an exhaustive list of all strikes. These are just some of the big ones. Uh, so the first one we have here is the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Uh, it has its origins in the Panic of 1873, uh, the Economic Depression, and the effects uh, that were felt through the economy for several years because of that. Uh, during the Panic of 1873, when the economy started to collapse, uh, the railroads would cut wages. Uh, that's one of the things businesses would do. They could go to their employees and say, look, we are not making as much money, therefore we have to cut your wages. You can either take a pay cut or you can take a layoff. Which do you want? Uh, and so, so they would cut wages. Well, by 1877, four years after this uh, panic started, workers are being paid only 45% of what they had been getting in 1873. So imagine your salary has been cut in half over the last uh, four years. And so railroad workers uh, started with the Baltimore and Ohio, Ohio Railroad, uh, but workers in several different railroad companies uh, went on strike. They started in, in West Virginia, it moved up into Pittsburgh, uh, and then it would move in different places around the country as more workers found out what was going on. The army ended up being sent in uh, to stop the strikes, uh, especially in uh, West Virginia. The local police had been sent in to stop the strike in West Virginia, and they went to talk to the workers and uh, decided, no, they were on the side of the workers and didn't do anything. So, uh, 
the state militia and the army had to be called out. So there was violence between uh, the authorities and the workers, but there was also violence on from the side of the workers directed toward the businesses. Okay, uh, this is a, a drawing of uh, the destruction of the Lebanon Valley Railroad Bridge, uh, wherever that happens to be. I'm just reading the caption down here at the bottom. Uh, but that's one of the things that the workers did in several rail yards. They set fire to uh, the rail cars. In this case, they destroyed this bridge the business had, had put up. The problem with that is because there was so much destruction of property and so so much damage um, many people are going to be turned off from supporting this union uh, and and the strike ended up collapsing uh, because people I can't support you you destroy this uh, one of the, the business owners uh, was a guy named Tom Scott Tom Scott had uh, been in the railroad business for years and uh, he his company was destroyed uh, because of the railroad strike of 1877. A major, major strike is in 1892, and it's called the Homestead Strike. Okay. Uh, this one's probably talked about more on, on tests uh, than, than the others. Okay. Homestead Strike uh, starts in, in Pennsylvania at the, homes, at the Homestead Steel Mill, which is part of Andrew Carnegie's steel empire. Okay. The workers uh, had seen kind of this, the same thing happen as, as the railroad workers. Their wages had been cut. Um, they had, before they'd been sold to Carnegie, they, they had been kind of a, I don't want to say they were sharing in the profits of the mill, but they were, they were getting uh, incentives. Uh, and with Carnegie, they they weren't, and so they they took over the plant. Uh, this is something else that the strikers do. They could take over the plant, and uh, they said, "Look, we're taking over the plant, and we're not going to have the plant up and running again until we get a better contract." Carnegie uh, is at this point he is not overseeing day to day operations of his uh, business. He leaves that to uh, the chairman of his company. It's a guy named Henry Clay Frick. Uh, Carnegie was actually vacationing in Scotland, and, and Frick uh, sent him a telegram saying, hey, there's a strike in Homestead. Uh, what, what do you want me to do about that? And Carnegie's response was, well, I, handle it. Which Frick took to mean, I can do whatever I want. Frick tells the workers he is not going to negotiate, and they need to go back to work. They tell him they're not going to go back to work until he negotiates. So instead, he hires Pinkertons. And he hires them to go in and retake the plant. What Pinkertons is going to do is they're going to put uh, 300 armed men on, on two boats. They're going to sail them down the river, uh, where they, and they will dock basically right behind the plant, rush the plant, and uh, force the strikers out. Unfortunately for the Pinkertons guys, uh, as the barges come down, they, they're seen, and... Uh, the workers are there to meet them, and they open fire. The workers open fire on the Pinkertons. Pinkertons opens fire on on the workers. Uh, the Pinkertons men were were held down. They were held on the barges. Several wounded uh, before they finally had to surrender. Uh, if you think of this as, as kind of military action, uh, and then they they're they're drug. You know they have to walk out of town uh, with the. Uh, families and friends of all the people in the plant, you know, they're on the side of the road, kind of, you know, throwing things at them, yelling at them, spitting at them, hitting them. Um, it takes the army, it takes the state militia uh, going in uh, to restore order, and, and that's, the troops are sent in, and uh, they force the strikers out. And so the strike itself only lasted about two weeks, uh, but in those two weeks, uh, the strike was broken. Uh, the union was broken, and the plant was back under company control, and uh, the people that were working there, if you had been a part of the strike, if you'd been working at the plant before the strike, uh, you actually ended up making less money than you were uh, before the strike had started. So it was an absolute disaster for the union, uh, but it was also a PR nightmare for Carnegie. Uh, this is a, a picture of... Uh, 
the the Pinkertons as they're trying to come out come out come off the barges and the workers firing back. Um, this is an image from the other side as the uh, workers are, are you know they've taken over the plant they've beaten beaten the Pinkertons. Um, maybe you see the Pinkertons uh, having to march through the group here. The last strike we're going to look at is the Pullman strike. Uh, from 1894. This is another railroad strike. It was caused by the Panic of 1893. And I use it because it's specific to the Pullman Company, and it shows a couple different things here. Hey, um, the Pullman employees, uh, they rented their homes from the Pullman Company. The Pullman Company set up a town. So you had a company town. And uh, they said, you know, as part of, part of working for us, we will rent you... Uh, your house. You can come stay in the house that the company owns. You just pay us rent. Well, because of the Panic of 1893, economic downturn, uh, Pullman cuts wages. And and they cut wages and they cut wages. And over, over the last year, they've cut wages by about one-third. And so the company knows that the workers are not making as much money, but the company did not cut rent. So they cut wages, but they didn't cut rent. You still owed the same amount for your house. And uh, finally, the American Railway Union, which is the union uh, that the, the Pullman guys are working for, uh, they said, you know what, we, we can't do this. You know, our, our expenses remain the same, but our, our take-home pay is less. And so they called the strike. The president of the ARU is this guy, Eugene V. Debs. Uh, you might see him in, in small paragraphs here, from, from here uh, through the next several chapters, uh, as he is going to be president here of this labor union. Later, he will become a socialist. Uh, believing that that uh, the workers needed to uh, kind of take over and eliminate the the business elite, uh, he would run for president uh, five times uh, over the course of the next three decades. Uh, the Pullman Company is going to go to court, and they are going to get an injunction, it's a court order, uh, to stop performing some activity. In this case, the strike. Uh, Pullman gets an injunction from the court. Uh, ordering the strikers to stop uh, based on the Sherman Antitrust Act. Their argument, this is what I mentioned earlier, uh, the company's argument is that the workers had combined to restrain and prevent trade, which the company argued was illegal under the Sherman Antitrust Act. The court agreed and ordered the strikers to, to stop, uh, but they refused. And so what the Pullman Company did is they actually went to a rail yard uh, that was unoccupied and they found a car that was carrying the U.S. mail. And they actually pushed this one rail car uh, into their rail yard in uh, Cleveland, in Ohio, pushed this, this car in there and again ordered the strikers, okay, get back to work. Strikers, of course, refused. And then Pullman went to the government and said, now the strikers are disrupting the delivery of the mail. And that's going to cause the government to send in the troops. The army goes in to break this up on the idea that the strikers were preventing delivery of the mail. Okay. So just another case of the business or the government siding with the businesses. All right, once again, these were very long. Uh, the business notes were just as long. Um, but I need to tell you these stuff. These, these are kind of the two heaviest ones, the business and the labor. Uh, these are all there, uh, part of the same chapter. So after this, they will get shorter. Uh, thank you for hanging around. Thank you for taking these notes. We will work with them in class.